So Wen Zhang Zhao is Assistant Professor of Bioinformatics at Harvard Medical School and Director of the Inflammation and Meta Metabolism Computational Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. As a world expert in computational genomics, he develops bioinformatic and statistical tools for use in understanding human diseases, especially in studies of immunometabolic response. His talk today is, um, is entitled The Severely Ill Patient Study of MECFS. So please join me in thanking Wen Zhang. Um, sure. Yeah, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to uh, share some of the results that uh, um, we have from this severely ill patient study that Ron mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, as Ron mentioned, you know, all the funding for this study uh, came from the end MECFS project, which was a grassroots effort. Uh, by the Open Medicine Foundation to support MECFS research. So, um, as we all know here, MECFS is a serious long term illness affecting, unfortunately, multiple organ systems of the body. So, this makes the disease harder to understand. So, if we see the diagram on the right here, um, you know, clockwise, you get this muscle systems, the GI tract, the immune systems, the um, heart vascular systems, and the HPA um, neurohormonal system um, that are all affected potentially by the disease, and that um, leads to the potential uh, problem in the central nerve system that, that we see from these patients. So to understand this problem, uh, again, as Ron mentioned earlier, we probably have to look at the patients um, carefully first and see where the signals are and then design um, experiments to test our hypothesis. So um, I, I think I showed this a couple times before um, in terms of the study design, um, we basically wanted to look at a few severely ill patients but uh, look at um, their genes, um, their, their geno uh, genomic sequence, their um, RNA sequence um, and expression level, their proteins, the uh, metabolites, um, and, and see what are the differences between the patients and the controls. And further, we would like to um, check the functions of their cells, for example, the NK cells, the muscle cells, um, and uh, um, again, see um, whether there's a signal between patients and the controls. And also, um, we want to check on the organ functions of each of the organs that we can test through clinical lab uh, tests and, and see whether um, there are particular clue that we can use and correlate with molecular level uh, signal that we can see. And obviously, we know that uh, the microbiomes and, uh, as Ron mentioned earlier, the, the environmental exposure might also contribute to the disease phenotype. So that was the plan um, for this study. And, um, ah, and there was a question that came up yesterday. How would we actually define those patients as severely ill patients? Um, and it remind us that this was the first study done uh, by the Open Medicine Foundation um, at Stanford. So the um, inclusion and exclusion criteria that were picked at that time was that uh, the patients had to be diagnosed by a um, specialist as a MECFS patient, and the patient has to be homebound and spend uh, more than 14 hours um, in bed uh, as measured by you know, sensors such as Fitbit and uh, the patient and family report, and also um, the SF36 physical function score of the patient has to be less than 70, and uh, the Kanofsky score uh, has also to be 70. I guess if we were to design a study, again, we probably would pick a uh, you know, better definition on the severeness of these patients um, today, but uh, this was what we did um, you know, a couple of years ago. So um, as Ron already mentioned, since we tried to look at um, the 
characteristics of the patients from the molecular level, the cellular level, the organ level of the patients, and um, um, the, the clinical phenotypes of the patients. Um, this involves a lot of different type of analysis, different technologies were used, and um, um, you know, different technologies actually had to be developed. So there's a number of researchers at the Genome Technology Center that actually did the wet lab and um, um, also the clinicians and the clinical researchers who actually recruited the patients and uh, did the sample processing. I just want to acknowledge them first. So uh, our team tried to look at the patient information collected um, in pretty much three perspectives. Uh, the one way to look at this would be to consider the patients as one group and uh, the controls as a separate group and ask the question, uh, what are the differences for each one of the type of the measurements between the patients and the controls? So that's straightforward. And since we measure patient information at multiple levels, we can then actually look at each one of the patients across different type of measurements and try to correlate uh, the molecular measurements with specific phenotypes of the patient. Obviously, in order to do this, we have to actually define well the phenotypes of the ME-CFS patients. And as I guess uh, a lot of people in this room know, uh, that's actually a challenge for um, you know, diagnosis of CFS and define um, the phenotypes of CFS. And, and lastly, we want to uh, integrate what we learned here um, with actually what has been done uh, in the past about this disease, as well as um, other relevant neurological diseases and try to gain insight uh, about the cause of the disease and the potential treatment. So that's sort of the general plan here. And as Ron mentioned earlier, one of the things that we put as higher priority is to get the data online so the researchers across the world can actually access to this data. Um, so, so far there are about uh, 200 uh, researchers um, having access to the data. This is the website and um, uh, I just listed a few here. Obviously, we'll hear from Neil soon uh, about his findings. Um, and uh, David Aspen, who's um, a researcher at uh, uh, Los Angeles, um, is, is looking at uh, the microbiomes and helping us to figure out its impact on neuroprotect and uh, uh, metabolites in the patient. And Dawei Li, uh, who's in uh, Vermont, um, is using this data to look at uh, the retroviruses in the genome and see whether these endogenous retroviruses um, actually pl potentially play a role um, in the disease. So again, as I mentioned earlier, <laughs> um, defining the precise phenotypes of uh, uh, ME-CFS patients is actually a challenge. Um, so this is what we did. Um, so we basically used four types of measurements on these patients. I don't think it's perfect, but that's our first try on defining patient um, phenotypes. So we have the sensor data um, from Fitbit, and uh, we have the questionnaire data to measure the quality of life, for example, SF36 or Konofsky or Promise, um, to compare patients versus controls, and as you can see, there's a clear difference between patients and the controls. We should probably have used better questionnaire, but at that time, that's what we um, knew uh, what to do. And uh, the cognitive testing um, showed somewhat a difference, you know, which might be relating to, for example, brain fog in the patients. And, and as you can see, there's a variance between patients versus controls in terms of their cognitive uh, ability. And uh, as we know from, for example, the uh, 2015 Institute of Medicine report, uh, sleep problem is one of the core symptoms of the disease. And if you compare patients versus controls, you see a clear difference. So uh, <laughs> this is probably a, 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 a Something that everybody knows, you know, the patient is uh, homebound, bedbound, 
So the, in terms of number of steps that they took based on sensor data is very f low uh, in most of those patients. And uh, this is the quality of life measurements uh, from uh, SF36. So what we can see immediately is that these are the uh, patients that we used as controls, and this is the general U.S. population uh, measurement. And you can see that uh, the MACFS patients that we studied, since they're severely ill, they're far away from the um, controls. And in the middle, you can see most of the well-known uh, significant human diseases, and they're actually uh, closer to the controls than uh, the severely ill patients that we see. So. Um, I think it's clear that uh, uh, ME-CFS patients suffer from uh, debilitating diseases and um, you know, that, that we should study this disease seriously. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, there's significant difference between sleep data um, in the patients comparing to the controls. So the convention that I use in these slides are uh, the orange ones are always patients and the blue ones are the controls. And you can see in terms of the REM latency, the stage three, um, sleep latency and uh, the movement uh, arousals, et cetera, the pulse, um, there, there's significant difference between patients and the controls. Um, <laughs> I just want to bring this up. So I'll mention some of the techniques that developed in the Genome Center um, about uh, detecting um, viruses in or pathogens in, in, in the patients. And I just came across this paper or, or article uh, in Scientist, uh, which is the latest uh, before I came here. And uh, um, as you can potentially read here, the title is The Viral Brain, and uh, what it says here is that uh, scientists may need to seriously reconsider um, the hypothesis that the pathogens can play a, a, a part in uh, neurologic, ne neurodegenerative diseases, and specifically uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and some of the other neurodegenerative diseases uh, were mentioned. So the reason I want to bring this up is twofold. One is that uh, uh, there was a question, I guess Rob asked it, you know, what actually caused CFS patient um, the, the, the disease? And uh, I guess, you know, for a lot of the well-known diseases where perhaps orders of magnitude more resources have been put to the research, you know, even today we don't really know what actually caused you know, for example, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, um, you know, let alone for ME-CFS. Um, so uh, I guess our community probably faced much bigger challenge with limited resource, and that makes, um, you know, the patient uh, advocacy groups, the, you know, the foundations, to be critical in our research to actually find the cause of the disease and potentially find a cure. Um, Ron already mentioned this. This was um, one of the data sets um, in this study um, where uh, 20 common DNA viruses were analyzed, and we didn't see a difference between patients and the controls. And uh, um, this is another uh, view of the uh, um, viral enrichment study that Ron mentioned earlier, uh, the analo virus is, um, in, you know, another name for it is uh, the transfusion transmitted the virus or TT viruses. You can see that uh, between patients and the controls, we actually don't see uh, a significant difference. Uh, if anything, the, the, the patient level is actually lower uh, for this virus compared to the controls. Um, and uh, we also tested in clinical lab tests the common antibodies um, between patients and controls, and we didn't see a significant difference either. Um, and the Batonella and the Lyme tests uh, didn't show a difference as well. However, what we found uh, in the next few slides, uh, I'm going to summarize some of the positive results that we see here, which might lead to new ideas and further testings in uh, a, a larger patient cohort. So one of the differences that we found was this, um, um, this, this normal rhyme in 
in the cortisol levels in the blood, which you would see that uh, it picks up uh, in the morning and uh, get decreased uh, uh, gradually uh, as the day goes on, uh, which you can see here in the controls. Uh, we see a, a flattened pattern in the patients, which might due to the sleep problems of the patients, uh, or maybe it also contributes to the disease. Um, when we look at the, the, the cytokines of the patients, um, we see a, a significant number of cytokines show difference between patients and the controls, and uh, we compared each one of the differences uh, with uh, what published in the past, since there are a number of publications out there already. Um, for all of them, actually, the direction of the changes, for example, the increased uh, uh, leptin levels, the increased GM-CFS levels, et cetera, are uh, consistent with the past uh, findings, except that the significance and the magnitude of changes are bigger here, uh, presumably because these are severely ill patients, so the signal is expected to be larger. Um, one of the potentially uh, less reported findings is this uh, cytokine brain-derived uh, neurotrophic factor, uh, which is a well-known marker for a number of neurological diseases, for example, severe Alzheimer. And we see that there's about a threefold uh, decrease of this uh, cytokine in the patients compared to the controls, suggesting that uh, you know, m potentially there's a significant uh, uh, neurological component in this disease um, comparing to the patient level. So we next looked at the metabolites, and uh, out of the almost 600 metabolites that were measured, um, about 10% of them show significant difference between patients and controls. And because of time, I only show three of them here, which show the biggest difference. And uh, from the, um, I guess, left to the right, um, or right to left, uh, you get this uh, hydro, uh, hydroxyproline, which is known to uh, be uh, significantly enriched in the connective tissues, and uh, the, 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 the significant increase of the plasma level of this uh, amino acid might you know, correlate or might be the consequence of the uh, protein degradation of the connective tissues, um, as Nell. Uh, pointed out, and, and we see a significant increase of uh, lysines and a lot of different amino acids. And again, that might be a, uh, a, a consequence of the uh, increased degradation of uh, proteins in patients that we see comparing to the controls. And we see a significant decrease of this molecule indopropionate, which is well-known neuroprotectant molecule. Uh, you might know that indopro Pionate is investigated in, for example, Alzheimer's as a potential uh, treatment or, or supplement for Alzheimer uh, patients. So if we compare just the pattern of the changes in the metabolomics data with the other diseases, um, these are the top ones that, uh, for example, Huntington disease, um, you know, that, that are most similar to uh, to the pattern that we see in these patients. Again, this probably can generate some of the hypotheses that uh, would require further testing. Um, when we look at the gut microbiome in the patients, as you can see here, these are the patients, these are the controls. Um, I guess one of the striking the difference that we see here is, uh, is this you know, yellow stripes in some of those patients, and these are the uh, acmansia. Um, uh, species uh, that you see uh, you know, uniquely um, increased uh, to a large amount in the patients, but not in the controls. And uh, we know, for example, in uh, multiple sclerosis, there's uh, similar findings there. So these are the so-called Baruco microbial uh, species. Um, so next, I'll move to whole genome sequencing. Um, since we only studied uh, uh, a few, because obviously the funding issue, uh, a few severely ill patients, um, identifying the causal variants uh, 
um, in patients comparing to the controls is always a you know a, a tough uh, task. So uh, we, we we look at this problem through a, a two um, type of analysis. So the first one. Um, is to look for the significantly enriched variants, those variants that at least increased by five-fold in the patients comparing to the background population, and this is a list of those genes. Um, and, uh, um, you know, for example, the neurexin uh, one is one of the genes that we're uh, trying to follow up the, the CUR genes, which came up yesterday, is another group that we're trying to follow up at the moment. Um, uh, so far, we haven't observed an enrichment in variants on the uh, transient receptor potential ion channels, um, which also came up uh, in, in some of the previous studies. So this is uh, just an example uh, of the neurexin genes. Just uh, I put this here, it's just because it's well known. Um, in some of the neurological diseases, for example, OCD, um, um, et cetera. And uh, this, is, this gene is um, more than one megabasis long in the genome, which make it uh, uh, subject to um, you know, mutations and other type of uh, variants. And this is basically a plot of each one of the patients, and you can see that the number of variants on this gene. Um, now, to actually pinpoint uh, what's the cause, or, or if there's a, a, a you know, effect on the function of this gene, probably would require uh, larger studies and functional analysis or functional testing. Um, as we already <laughs> talked about this yesterday, the CUR genes, since they are, you know, killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors on the NK cells, and they work with HLA genes, so it's really well known um, that uh, you know, they affect NK cell functions, and uh, we see uh, quite significant differences in multiple inhibitory and uh, activating uh, genes um, you know, in, in this class of genes. And um, um, you know, it, it occurred to us that actually sequencing uh, the CUR genes well is not a trivial task, and uh, we talked to the uh, HIW community, which stands for uh, International Histocompatibility and the Immunogenetics um, uh, Workshop. Um, the, 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 we were told that there's actually no uh, well-established protocols to sequence these genes correctly, uh, largely because there's copy number variations together with the um, uh, the, the variants in the sequence of these genes. So we're developing tools uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Marcelo um, um, at uh, Stanford uh, Blood Center and, and the HIW community to, uh, to try to do this correctly. Um, the other way that we can look at the problem would be to look at those rare pathogenic variants in the patient. So what's shown here, uh, each column is a patient, and each row is the variants occurring on that gene. So it's well known that there's uh, this so-called burden test that you can test the association between rare variants um, in a disease. So um, uh, because of time, and uh, you know, since we only studied a few uh, patients at the moment, uh, you know, I don't think that we have a definitive answer uh, on some of these uh, findings yet, uh, but some of these things uh, potentially would make sense. For example, at the positive control, you would see this uh, uh, CFTR, which is obviously <laughs> uh, involved in cystic fibrosis, um, and, and most of our, I think all of our patients are Caucasians, so, so you would expect to see a heterozygous uh, CFTR uh, pathogenic variant in uh, a few percent of the patients, so that's sort of the positive control. And um, um, we actually see, for example, this is actually the Parkinson gene um, that, that occurs in uh, you know, three of the 20 patients, and these are uh, often stop-gain codons, meaning that uh, you know that one copy of the two uh, copies of the protein uh, doesn't uh, work. Um, because of a, a premature stop uh, codon there. And, and the question then is that uh, whether 
that actually might contribute to the disease phenotype. Uh, obviously, in the Parkinson field, uh, a heterozygous, a, a homozygous uh, defect of this gene would uh, definitively cause early onset of Parkinson disease. Uh, a heterozygous um, uh, problem, a pathogenic variant, would uh, be a significantly associated with uh, Parkinson. Uh, early onset Parkinson disease. And uh, you know, if we study it further, you can see, for example, the Adam TSL2, which stands for a, um, uh, uh, a gene with a long name, but basically it's a <laughs> metallo uh, protease gene, and it's known that it is also involved in um, a, uh, a series of uh, neurological diseases. Um, for example, there's a paper that just came out, uh, I think this year, uh, which was the largest study of Alzheimer diseases where they studied, I think, more than 20,000 patients and 40,000 controls. And, uh, you know, this group of um, uh, metalloproteases are found to be significantly associated with um, um, Alzheimer disease. Um, you know, obviously that's, you know, huge undertake of studies and, uh, you know, people still are trying to figure out those rare pathogenic variants uh, for neurological diseases like Alzheimer's. So for a CFS, obviously, you know, we need a lot more work in order to get a definitive answer. So um, one way that we're uh, approaching this problem, so this sort of ongoing research, um, is to uh, take together the rare pathogenic and re enriched variants that I talked about earlier together with the uh, gene results from uh, previous GWAS and targeted gene studies. Um, there are about 2,500 variants that uh, uh, have been mentioned so far. Um, and, and then, you know, compare that results with um, the uh, genetic results from other neurological diseases. So uh, this is <laughs> probably well known. It's the, the, the Klimt uh, uh, painting on the, 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 the tree of life, and uh, you know, if we look at the, the opposite side, you know, the idea is obviously that the different variants in different genes that might contribute to the disease, and what we actually want to figure out is the common uh, impact uh, or common pathway that contribute to the disease process, and hopefully we can find that uh, soon. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, since we look at this disease, um, you know, quote unquote, deeply across my, you know, multiple levels, uh, one thing that uh, we're able to uh, start looking at is to correlate the disease phenotypes, as I described earlier, with the molecular measurements. In other words, you, you ask the question, what are the molecular measurements that would be significantly correlated with uh, you know, each one of the phenotypes and how they would uh, correlate with each other? For example, this is a group of uh, uh, inflammation-related uh, cytokines, as I described uh, earlier, um, and, and since they're so correlated with each other, <laughs> they, they show a, a stripe um, you know, in the middle. And uh, because of time, I'll just show you some of the most uh, uh, significant uh, findings from that, preliminary findings from that uh, analysis. So you get uh, this indopropionate, as I mentioned earlier, that's significantly associated with a number of uh, phenotypes, for example, quality of life, uh, pain scores, et cetera. And uh, this is one of the uh, microbiome um, uh, species um, which was also shown to be enriched in patients in the publication that Marin Hansen's group published between twins. Um, and, and, and it's also significant here. The cortisol levels, I already talked about it. The uh, PDNF um, findings, we already talked about it. And uh, uh, the TNF beta is actually um, a, a representation of a group of uh, inflammation related uh, cytokines, uh, which is associated with the, um, the outcomes. And we'll get this 5 uh, hydro hydroxylysing, um, that's sort of the uh, significant associated with the phenotypes, but on the opposite uh, side. So I want to spend a little bit of time talk about uh, indopropionate, and that's just because uh, 
Um, it's one of those things that we find to have significant difference uh, between patients and controls in their blood. And it's not only in the pro uh, pionate, but also we get this uh, phenol pro pionate, which is uh, the, um, uh, the metabolic uh, uh, outcome of uh, phenylalanine. And um, um, you know, other molecules such as uh, ferric acid are also lower in patients. So you basically see a pattern of neuroprotective metabolites to be lower in patients compared to the controls. And uh, this molecule uh, became of uh, interest to us mainly because um, we know that as human beings we don't uh, possess the enzyme in our genome that can generate this molecule. So um, this is tryptophan, for example, and uh, you know, it has to be um, metabolized by uh, the, um, the specific microbe in our gut in order to generate this molecule uh, in the propionate, uh, which would uh, you know, do its, its neuroprotective roles uh, in the body as an antioxidant uh, uh, suppression of uh, inflammation, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the reason it's studied in um, diseases as Alzheimer's uh, or diabetes for that matter as well. So, uh, just I mentioned earlier, you know, there's actually only um, one group of uh, microbiomes that's known to generate this um, type of molecules, and that's what we actually try to, uh, you know, study uh, in collaboration with David Astrin uh, to see whether we can actually identify these, path uh, these microbes and uh, quantitate them. So, um, um, in terms of next steps, um, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is, uh, as I already mentioned earlier, to integrate the findings of uh, CFS patients with uh, findings of other neurological diseases. And uh, the, um, the, the idea behind that is that uh, whether there are common uh, symptoms that uh, can, you know, shed light on the uh, potential mechanism of the disease, since, you know, we have to borrow strengths from somewhere. <laughs> and, and the second one is to, uh, to, to look at the gut microbiome and uh, uh, try to see whether um, some of those micro microbes might be responsible for producing the, uh, uh, the neuroproductive metabolites that we see lacking in the severely ill patients. I'll skip that. And uh, uh, with the general support of um, uh, Open Medicine Foundation, we uh, just started uh, a center at Harvard um, you know, to uh, to do MECFS study. So these are some of the uh, projects that uh, we're you know, starting to do in collaboration with uh, uh, you know, the Stanford Center and with uh, you know, pretty much everybody here uh, in the CFS research community. So, um, yeah, so that include uh, looking at uh, immune systems and, and as Ron mentioned, looking at, for example, the uh, RNA viruses um, and studying the uh, muscle biopsies of post-exertion malaria patients and see whether there's a clear signal uh, which, is, which might be tissue specific. And also look at the cardiopulmonary systems uh, which might uh, you know, uh, contribute to the post-exertion malaise and uh, the orthostatic intoler intolerance uh, of the patients uh, as well as the <coughs> molecular imaging of the central nervous system. Um, For those of us who are not familiar with the PPA and for those at home, can you just elaborate a little bit more on, um, on how it's generated? So you mentioned it was um, generated through the microbiome in the gut. Um, are, there all, are there mammalian pathways that can also generate it? And what, yeah, that's a very good question. And what do you think the targets are in the brain for this metabolite? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, this is actually a paper uh, that came out last year, uh, 2018, and uh, that's, I think, the first paper that actually uh, 
uh, try to answer the question that you just asked. It's a terrific question because in the past we, we, we didn't know, or, or you know, we as a research community didn't know actually how you know phenylalanine, uh, tryptophan, uh, tyrosine, et cetera, get converted into the neuroprotective molecules in the nervous system. We just don't have any idea. We know that uh, um, you know this Clostridium uh, species has to be there in order to generate these molecules, but we don't know the mechanism. So the paper only came out last year to, to identify um, the type of enzymes in the microbe that uh, uh, cause this particular reaction. <laughs> so, you know, that's the first time. And, and the second part of your question is, um, you know, what's the, um, you know, protective uh, uh, mechanism of this? Um, I don't know if people have a clear answer to this, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's effect of this is well studied, for example, in Alzheimer's and, uh, and diabetes, and it seems to be uh, lower inflammation and uh, antioxidant. 